Um, I would like to firstly introduce you to what this whole exascale computing actually means, what it's supposed to deliver, and um, move on with, with explaining the concepts that we are trying to get into C++ or has been adopted into C++ and um, then give you uh, smaller examples, or one, one small example um, on how to, to use it to um, fight the challenges of, of exascale computing, which I will also mention in a little bit. So what is this exascale thingy? So exa is a number with 18 zeros, right? So it's, um, and, and the exascale computer is supposed to execute um, 10 to the power of 18 floating point operations per second. That's a huge number. So if you take every person on earth, that's 7.3 billion people, right? That's a number with nine zeros over there. It would take them, if, if you give all of them an, a calculator and let them execute one operation per second, it would take them, would take all of mankind four years to do the same calculation that this exaflop computer is supposed to calculate in one second. So um, just to give you a little relation on, on, on the power of this computer. So um, you might think, what do, what do we need it for? So um, for, for reference, the usual desktop and um, desktop computers execute something around a, well, 0.5 teraflop depending on the hardware you have in. If you have one of the newer NVIDIA cards, you get up to a teraflop, right? That's um, to the power of nine. So um, still some orders of magnitude. But um, if, you, if you look at the um, development of those computers, we had those um, teraflop computers, um, I think, in the 90s, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think the first teraflop computer was in the 90s. Anyways, doesn't doesn't really matter. So um, you might wonder why we need those those calculations. So one one of the big fields there is um, aerospace and computational fluid dynamics. So to, in order to to simulate the behavior of airplanes and um, cars and spaceships and whatnot, we we can't afford to build prototypes to put them in a, in a wind channel, right? Because that's too expensive. So we want to, to simulate the behavior of the different, different systems up front, right? So, um, and to, to make a more realistic image, we have to increase the resolution. And once increasing the resolution, we have to do more calculations. Another nice example, so you can see that very well now, um, is astrophysics. So this example is um, colliding two galaxies, right? So you have um, two, two big galaxies with a million stars in it. Each star is, well, simplified one particle and you do a um, so-called M-body simulation. So each particle needs to, to know the gravitational force of the other um, parts in the system. So that's a huge calculation and in order to to understand better what's going on there, we need bigger machines to increase the resolution again. So maybe not collide two, two galaxies, but um, who knows what. Right? Um, next big field is um, biomedical systems, so computational drug design and um, understanding the, the flow of blood through the, uh, through the body um, and all those those, those complicated biological fields, medical fields, um, where, you, where you want to understand the, um, the, the inner workings of the body in, in, a, in a more precise way. And um, that's also something we need a lot of computing power for. Um, the other very, very big field is, of course, climate and weather. So um, each weather prediction is calculated by a computer. The, um, whole climate change is um, predicted by some computer simulation, right? We, we always try to, to match the past um, measurements of, of climate change with our um, computer simulations. And this is a picture of the uh, Hurricane Sun, uh, Sandy, which is, well, um, simulated with, with um, 
some weather um, prediction model. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, the, the um, precision of this simulation is in the order of um, 100 kilometers, right? So and if you care about the people that might be affected by such a storm, um, 100 kil kilometers um, square meters, 100 um, square kilometers is a lot, right? You need, if, if it goes to, to New York City, you have to evacuate a lot of people, a lot of businesses. So that's um, a very expensive decision to make. And if we have um, simulations that actually help um, to, to build up a good decision, so um, that would be very nice. That's something we need um, exaflop computers for. Well, maybe not exaflop, but a lot of computing powers. Um, another big field is combustion. So how, do, how, do, how does the process of burning stuff actually work? So combustion engines and, and stuff like that. And we, we absolutely need to have a higher resolution. So you might not see this in, in, the, in the picture here, but um, if you look at the numerics and the actual workings of, of those flames, you, you will see a lot of differences to the actual reality. So you have a lot of numerical instabilities and so on. Um, and in order to fight those, we need to develop better models to understand those processes in, in a way um, better form. Um, the other part is um, material science. So this is a um, picture of a nanotube, right? So um, material scientists are very, very interested in um, simulating their new materials, the, the behavior of their new materials um, within computer simulations um, just to make their life easier, just to, to test the, the actual materials they have been built up. Um, so, if, if, so for example, if you build some, some prototype with, with a new material, right, you don't just want to destroy it right away because it took you so many years to develop the material. You want to first simulate and check whether this material is any good in the first place. So um, same goes for, for fusion reactors, right? If a fusion, reac if a fusion reactor goes wrong, well, it will blow up. And you don't want to risk that, that it's going to blow up. So you want to make sure that your um, that your plasma is really confined in the in the magnetic field, and that that it actually produces enough energy, because it's a very very expensive process to build such a such a thing. And last but not least, unfortunately, we also have the weapons. Um, but I won't go into that, just for sakeness, com completeness. Okay, so in order to to move on to build such a exascale machine, um, we have certain challenges. So I usually um, think of um, those two major challenges. So the, the first thing is, how do we actually program those things, right? So uh, we, we, will, we, we are expecting to have a massively parallel system. So um, a system that's composed up of um, 10,000 of different nodes, and on each of those nodes, there are in the order of 1,000 concurrently running processes on it. So you have a really massive amount of compute nodes. In order to have such tightly coupled simulation, uh, I showed you earlier, you have to do a lot of communication, and you want to really, really be as fast as possible. Um, and the reason why you want to be as fast as possible, because such systems are expensive, right? So um, one of the biggest operational costs of, of such big supercomputers is certainly energy. So the, the energy consumptions um, cost the, the operating um, compute centers um, up to $100,000 a year, right? So um, that needs to be reduced. So um, the, the goal is to, to be in a power envelope of 20 megawatts, right? That's still a lot. So I just looked it up. I, I looked it up yesterday. The city of Delhi um, consumes at a very hot day 5.5 megawatts. So compare that to, to such a machine. That's pretty huge. And the current fastest computer, the uh, Tianhe 2, um, consumes 17 megawatts. Um, however, 
um, it operates at um, 33.9 petaflops, and that's just 4% of an exaflop. So you might need, you might see the dimension of those challenges. We we only have a 4% 4, 4 of, of this of this goal, but um, consume almost all of the power envelope, right? And um, that's actually the so those two challenges are mainly responsible why we don't have such systems yet. I'm, I'm pretty confident that um, if you put enough money into it, we can build such a computer that is really able to um, calculate um, one exaflop per second, theoretically, right? But the downsides are you have, to, you, you have to put a lot of energy into it, and those exaflops are probably just only in theoretic nature, right? So you just have, um, you just sum up the capabilities of your different processors, and um, you probably won't ever reach those um, one exaflop. And also this um, 33.9 petaflop is just, well, something like a theoretical number. It's been, um, it's, it's been calculated from, from a real benchmark, but um, it has been shown that a lot of those new new simulations, those those new numerical methods, are not really fit to those um, to, to to this to this benchmark anymore, because it's a um, dense matrix matrix multiplica multiplication. And what we ha have nowadays is um, sparse matrices, right, to save space and and things like that. So um, we currently are here. So this triangle here represents the TNA2, and um, this is the development from um, 1990. So the first teraflop computer was built then um, late 90s, something like that. Um, and so if you if you extrapolate this number. Um, it is expected that we have an exaflop machine by the year of 2020. Okay, so just just to give you an idea of the timeline, and what I also always find fascinating is the is the big gap. So we have the the sum of performances over here, right? That's the sum of all the fastest 500 supercomputers in the world, and the yellow line is the um, is the fastest machine in the world, right? And the blue line is the slowest machine. So you, you, you see this big gap, this big technological gap. So we, we usually only have one of those um, biggest systems, and, and all of the others are, well, a little slower, but still fast enough for most usages. OK, so there are currently three major um, endeavors to, to reach this exascale computing. So um, when, when we talk about programmability, we, we usually mention deep memory hierarchies, massive, massive parallelism. So the first contender, contender in the race is um, built around the low power ARM processes, right? So um, ARM released some, um, some new design um, and uh, switching to 64 bits, which is very, very um, useful for all those scientific scientific codes because those 64-bit architectures actually enable faster um, double precision calculations. So, um, and the and the hope with this ARM systems is that we um, can leverage the experience that has been built up by the embedded developers to really um, build a low-power system out of those um, low-power embedded processes. Um, and they probably will also embed some some GPUs in there. Um, that's actually the um, the, the um, biggest European um, project. Um, it's building. Uh, it's trying to build an exascale computer um, around the ARM processors. The next big contender is, of course, um, IBM and Nvidia. They teamed up together um, in the United States. Um, um, exascale initiative to to build, I think was it one or two systems, Michael? Uh, two systems for the, uh, for the, for the IBM, uh, right. Yeah. 
So we have with um, one that is built around the power processor with, with all its nice features and um, a NVIDIA accelerator very, very closely attached to it. But what you see here is that you still have um, complicated memory hierarchies, right? Because the accelerators have some local scratch pads, the power PC has, um, the power architecture has some um, cache hierarchies. Uh, so this memory hierarchies are really, really getting more and more important to remove the data movement. Um, the, the third contender is the um, Knight's Landing mini core processor from, from Intel, um, which is kind of something like a hybrid between those, um, between the accelerators and a general purpose um, CPU. So it has a lot of cores on them, but um, a lot of tiny cores, um, but very, very fit to those numerical calculations. And um, that's how you can reduce the, the whole energy footprint. So, but it also, despite that it's not a, um, a accelerator based design, it still um, exposes a lot of um, memory hierarchies. So um, very, very deep hierarchies. It has a um, very high bandwidth memory closely attached to the cores and it, had, and it, it has caches. It's built up in, in a tiled um, manner. So it's really, really um, hard with current tools to actually um, build programs that are um, data locality aware. Right, so um, how will C++ deal with all that? Right. So to repeat the challenges, we um, want a system that's programmable. Right, so um, we want something like that. We want to have um, all the puppies lined up, all eating from their own bowl, right? Um, problem is it never ends up that way. So they just get messed up and um, steal from each other, false sharing, get in the way, and well, the data is all over the place. Too bad. <laughs> so we, we really want to try to express this parallelism in a very, very nice and convenient way and also express the data locality, which is, which is very, very important to that, um, to get the, the most, most performance out of the, out, out of the system. So um, we identified um, four horsemen of the apocalypse. So it's, nowadays it's actually um, six. So energy and resiliency comes, comes into that as well. But I usually only try to focus on the, on the four horsemen because it matches up so nicely with, with this apocalypse um, picture. So um, what, we, what we need to fight um, when, when um, programming in parallel is at first starvation. So if you have a lot of different work packages of different nature, you um, might end up with starving one resource or another um, because you can't do proper load balancing or, or, or something like that. Um, the other big point is latency. Well, of course, we, we don't want to introduce latency. We want to, we want to, um, we want to build systems that don't have a lot of latency. So um, usually when, when people talk about latency, it's all about latency reduction. How do I make the latency small enough so that, that it doesn't affect my computation so much? Um, I think that's only one part of the, of the goal. You, you just can't, can't hide latency um, to, to be zero, right? You always have some kind of latency. You have network communication. You have um, you have your memory buses and whatnot. So the goal should be not to, to avoid latencies, but to be able to hide latencies in such a manner that you have always enough useful work to calculate. And the other thing is overheads. Parallel programming always comes with overheads. So we need, we need to have a way to, to reduce those overheads to the, to the minimal, minimal amount, right? So that means, um, avoid um, shared data and uh, things like that. And um, the, the fourth point is actually not waiting for contention, but actually contention. So you, you, you really want to avoid 
to to contend any part of your system, be it your um, your uh, inter-process communication when you when you have the cache coherency protocol, or um, the network system, or the memory bandwidth, or um, even the floating point units. You you really want to to avoid this. So um, this is just to give you give you an idea. So I hope um, that. I will be able to, to um, subtly cover all of those four points um, later on. If you, if you, um, if you discover one, one of those points, raise your hands and, and shout it out. So um, let's see. Um, so what, what's the current state of the art with parallelism in C++? So as you probably all know already, we have um, the, the stood threads, we have, we have mutex, and we have uh, with C++11, we, we have multi-threaded programming. We have it defined. So that was a very, very big step towards um, parallelism. Um, however, all those con constructs are, in my point of view, very, very low level. And well, um, threads are the go-to of today, right? So uh, you, you really want to, to avoid this. So um, the, the standardization committee um, has accepted or um, it's currently still still in in revision it's, um, but it has accepted the um, parallelism technical specification and the concurrency um, technical specification so um, both of them are very very important so the the concurrency technical specification as you have heard yesterday turns the concurrency introduced by threats into parallelism again so that's um, th that's why um, it's been denoted as a misnomer, right? And the, the, parallel, the parallelism t um, technical specification actually introduces higher level parallel constructs in a way that, that I believe is the first step in fighting exactly those challenges, right? And um, in addition to that, we have um, other smaller proposals um, Despite the fact that they are small in size, they are still very, very important and have a high impact. So resumable functions is, is one of the features I'm, I'm, I'm most excited about because that makes programming um, systems based on futures and, and things and asynchrony in general very, very easy, very, very convenient. You don't have to wrap around your head um, behind all this continuation style programming. So that's very very nice the task regions are are a very nice way to express fork join parallelism and the executors are um, what allows you to specify where and how your data is being executed so um, our vision in so our vision within the uh, hpx development within the stellar group and i hope the c standardization committee shares this um, vision as well is um, to, to really achieve a big story for parallelization by um, the year of 2020. So we, we don't really want OpenMP, OpenACC, or OpenCL exposed to the user directly. We, we really want to have some, some big unified picture that allows us to, to program accelerators, um, CPUs, and whatnot in a very efficient manner. Right, so that's that's um, the that's where we are, right? And uh, what I'm trying to show is um, um, later on is the experience that we we gained by um, implementing um, actually all of those um, proposals that that you have mentioned here. So um, we developed the HPX runtime system, which is a um, parallel runtime system. Uh, for C++, um, we are um, building a lot on the um, C++ standard API. So um, one of the main developers, Hartmut Kaiser, is actually um, in the C++ standardization committee as well. So we, we, we really try to put a focus on C++ standardization because we feel that's important, right? It's a very nice punchline to have. If you, if you know the standard, you can program in, in that runtime system. So that's very, very important to us to get those things standardized and standardized in, in, a, in a 
in a fashion that helps everybody, right? So the, the big thing that we haven't touched in uh, C++ standardization, though, is the um, ability to, to write um, parallel programs in a coherent and unified way, uniform way, not only on a single machine, but also on a distributed machine. So what we actually achieved is um, an API that's completely built on the, on the C++ um, 11, 14, and 17 constructs, but um, seamlessly extended it to work in, in a distributed computing environment as well. So um, you, you, um, you have a syntax and semantics that's the same for local and remote operations. And um, our runtime systems system enables a fully asynchronous code using really hundreds of millions of threads. And um, if you, if you um, look back at the beginning of the talk where, where um, I mentioned that we really have to deal with massive parallel systems, um, we, we absolutely have to get experience with massive parallel algorithms, with, with massive parallel programs now in order to, to deal with the massive parallel hardware we get um, in the next five years or so. So the, the innovative mixture is that we have um, a, a global system-wide address space where you can, where you can address objects um, on a remote machine or on the same machine in a transparent way. We call that um, active global address space. The active comes from, that comes from the fact that we are able to, to migrate components in the global address space from uh, one, one process to another in a very transparent way. But I won't go into, uh, I won't go too much into into detail there. So, um, the the biggest point here is the fine grained parallelism and lightweight synchronization, which we achieve by implementing um, user level threads or or green threads. So that's where the where the whole power comes from, which allows us to to really build those um, massive parallel software. Um, this is combined with with asynchronous um, task stealing and message driven computation. And um, I covered the local and remote execution and um, the, the, what, what we're currently working on. So we, we already have a um, very primitive way, um, uh, um, a prototype uh, of supporting hardware accelerators to, um, uh, to offload calculations in, well, some kind of the same manner um, that you have in OpenMP, but it's still a little little bit too low level, but we're working on that. Um, all right, so the, the concepts of parallelism that we, um, that we identified is that, um, first of all, you, you always want to have some execution restrictions, right? If you have some, some parallel algorithm, you might want to say, well, does this code, uh, can this code be run in parallel? Do I have to run it sequentially, right? So, um, one, one big decision here is, for example, the size of the data. So it doesn't make sense to parallelize a vector with, with 10 elements where you just add those elements because the overheads will get too expensive so that, that you get a negative effect there. Um, the next thing is the sequence the work items have to be executed. So that's actually um, the, the point where, where you turn concurrency into parallelism. So you want to to ex if you have a fully asynchronous system, you want to be able to um, to express the sequence, to express the data flow of the um, of the work that has to be executed. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, you you also want to express where the work items should be executed, and that's that's really the the point where. That, that excites me so much because we, we always fought with, with um, when, when, when dealing with those task de stealing systems, you, you can never be sure where the work is actually being executed. So the, that we figured out with the help of the standardization committee where the work items are actually being executed is such a big step forward that, um, that I can't emphasize it em em um, enough. And um, the, the last point is that you might want to pass parameters into the execution environment. So um, 
one one big problem when dealing with with parallel algorithms is always the the chunk size. So the number of items that have to be executed sequentially in order to mitigate the overheads of the parallel programming. Right. So um, that's where the parameters come in. You can um, pass different chunk sizing policies. You can um, pass it a fixed chunk size. So um, it's a it's a really extensible mechanism. It's a um, mechanism that um, that we don't um, that that the so all, all of those mechanisms are mechanisms that are not dictated by the by the standard, but are all user extensible. So they they can all be extended, and that's the the really nice thing. So um, to to give you a better picture, so we have, on top we have the we have the application, then we have the, the different concepts, and these are the the implementation of the concepts, right? We have the execution policies, we have the executors and um, executor parameters. So um, the execution policies uh, formulate the restrictions. Can it be executed in parallel? Does it need to be executed sequentially and or not? The executors are actually defining the sequence and where the work has to be executed and the executor parameters um, define the grain size. All of those concepts are built on top of futures, async, and, well, data flow. Um, and on top of those concepts, we can build the higher level par um, parallel uh, algorithms and um, for join paradigms and you name it. So um, this underlying system gives you a lot of flexibility to build any, any parallel algorithm paradigm that you can imagine. So that's a really, really powerful and efficient uh, way of expressing parallelism. So without going into detail too much, we have the, um, we have the execution policies. So um, you have sequential, uh, parallel, and um, parallel vectorized, right? So um, is someone in the audience that can't make sense of any of those. I think it has been covered yesterday by Michael pretty extensively, but if you have questions, okay. So uh, what's missing for us in the, in the bigger picture is that the parallelism TS only uses those parallel, uh, those, those execution policies for the parallel algorithms. So all those, those nice execution policies and ex executors are only used, are only really used in the parallelism TS. And that's um, one thing that kind of misses um, for us in the bigger picture for the whole um, parallelism construct. So uh, we extended it that in such a way that, we, that async takes an execution policy that um, nearly all asynchronous um, task spawning facility can take execution policies, which gives you a lot of control over um, how this function is being executed, right? As an implementer of those facilities, you just can't know what's the best for a specific application. So you absolutely need to have those extension mechanisms. Um, an extension to the to the execution policies, which I really want to um, to mention, is the um, task policy. So, in addition to the parallel and and sequential um, policies, we we extended it in such a way that um, you can pass the task well, keyword, it's an object in in the um, to the execution policy, and when you call a parallel algorithm, a parallel construct, then um, it doesn't wait until the computation is finished, but it returns a future instead. So that means that um, with this return future, you can easily integrate your, your parallel algorithms, your parallel constructs into your asynchronous control flow, which gives you um, a lot of more power to exploit the actual um, concurrency in your system. So moving on to, to executors. So executors are really just creating execution agents on which the work is performed. So it's a abstraction to where and how the, the tasks are being executed. So again, 
just limited to parallel algorithms, but I think that's not, not a, a big or breaking change to make there. So, um, but, but what we gain um, by executors is an abstraction, um, abstraction mechanism for launching work. So it, it doesn't matter if this um, work should be launched on a uh, accelerator device or on a um, remote machine or locally on a confined um, set of, of cores, right? So that's, that's a very, very powerful abstraction mechanism. And the uh, execution parameters they allow you to control the, the grain size of the work. So um, if you're familiar with OpenMP scheduling policies, you have static, guided, and, and dynamic. And um, with those execution parameters, you can actually build the very same um, uh, scheduling policies. But in addition to that, you have a, a much, much more finer control over, over the grain size. So, so you can actually um, use the runtime adaptive mechanisms inside of the HPX runtime system to, to dynamically adapt the grain sizes depending on, on the current load of the system, for example. So that, that's a very, very powerful mechanism. Um, you've seen that, so all those execution policies can be, can be rebound to, um, to run with a um, specific executor with a parameter or with both of them. So um, those execution policies are really, really um, customizable. So you can pass any, any of them into your, your parallel constructs, right? So let's try to put this all together. So um, the sex P routine is a very, very nice routine, right? So it's just calculating. Um, it's scaling um, one vector and um, adding it to another vector, right? So um, it's, it's a very, very simple and basic algorithm. So um, one, one problem that you might run into when you, when you write such a routine, when you go to non-uniform um, memory architectures, right, is that um, if you use um, std vector, for example, and, uh, and um, allocate n elements, then you will end up with all those n elements being on one specific NUMA domain, right? So, and when you, when you want to scale to, to different NUMA domains, then you run into a problem because um, all the memory is accessed through one memory controller, but you have uh, theoretically more than one. So um, that's, that's, the, that's the challenge of, the, of this algorithm, and I try to show you how to, how to solve this, this problem um, without using loops just using the parallel algorithms. So um, how would you formulate such, such an algor algorithm? So um, we are running out of time, so sorry I don't ask you how to solve it. So you really just um, uh, construct three vectors, right? And you, you, you're then able to use the STID transform. So that's how easy it is. And to, to build on, on Chandler's talk um, last morning, um, this is being compiled very, very efficiently, right? So um, it even vectorizes the different, um, um, the, the, the transform lambda. So you really get the most performance by just using this standard algorithm. And that's um, a very, very nice achievement from the compilers, right? So it's, it's really, the, the compilers are really, really able to, to um, remove all those nice abstractions that have been built up nowadays. So um, just as a small side remark. Um, however, this version is still not parallel, right? It's just running sequentially. Okay. So let's um, extend it in such a way that it runs in parallel. So it's really that easy. You just add the execution policy over there. And then all your code runs in parallel. Right. Very nice, isn't it? But this won't scale. This won't scale because the, the vector is still just allocated on one NUMA domain. So you need to extend it a little bit. So the extension is actually very, very simple. And I lied to you because I have a raw loop in there. So, um, but the extension is just, well, um, we have allocators, right? Vector can take an allocator. So, Pass it a NUMA allocator. It's 
that easy. And Numa allocator that just evenly distributes the, um, the different partitions of the vector onto the different Numa domains. And um, in the same sense, um, use the executors to, um, to, to calculate the partitions on just this Numa domain. That's really how easy it is. Right. So the, I want to show you the, the NUMA allocator directly to give you some more idea on how to, to build this and how this all works. So um, the NUMA allocator is really, sorry. Can you all read it? Great. So it's really just a, a regular C++ allocator, right? So you have the, um, all those type devs and um, the, the the biggest change is that you 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 have to pass it an, an executor um, um, template parameter, but other than that, it's well very very similar. So um, you pass it an exec executor parameter, and once um, the uh, standard library tries to allocate some number of elements, well, you just allocate the raw memory, right? you um, then evenly uh, distribute the, um, the, the number of elements to the uh, different executors, right? So if all of those executors run on a um, distinct NUMA domain, you can actually implement the first touch policy, right? So that's, that's uh, one of the techniques that is being used to, to fight um, this non-uniform -un uh, memory access in, in modern operating systems, the pages, uh, so when you, when you get a page fault, when you access a memory, then um, this page is being um, physically allocated on that memory controller where the, um, where the page fault happened on, on that NUMA domain. So um, we just touch up every, um, every element in this, in this vector, right? So it's um, a little stupid, but um, it works. So it's, it's a very primitive way, but yet it's, it's, it's so powerful that it really allows you to, to express this data locality. And it's, um, you, you will see the, the parallel algorithms all over the place again, right? So um, <clears throat> that's how it's implemented. Any questions? So um, you, you just run over all this, those executors um, calculate the begin and the end for, for this specific executor and then um, touch the, um, the memory um, for each element, right? And um, this parallel algorithm is confined to only run on um, this specific executor. So you actually have a very, very strong guarantee. You don't have to rely on some, well, best practice if you, if you just slap a, a OMP parallel 4 on top of your data initialization, you really have a very fine-grained control over the um, locality of your data. And what, what you see here is the um, task um, execution policy. So we, um, we have a vector of, of futures there um, <clears throat> where each of those um, uh, parallel algorithms um, are being synchronized on. So um, all the memory initialization in this um, specific example runs in parallel, right? So, um, and that's not just some, some, and that's actually the real code that, that we have in, in our repository in the, and in the release, okay? So, I'm sorry if, if I'm not able to, to explain in too much detail, but time is running short. And I still have so much things I want to talk about. <laughs> hmm? Hmm. Okay, so does this work? Well, kind of, right? So we compared it. So um, this um, uh, AX plus B times C is um, also, well, a very, very standard benchmark. So one, one of the benchmarks is the, the stream benchmark. Um, which is usually used to, to calculate, to measure the bandwidth of a system. So, uh, and that's currently implemented with, with OpenMP, right? So, and we said, 
well, okay, so we have this solution, so how good are we actually? And it turns out that we aren't that bad. So um, the, the most important thing is, so um, this, um, those two lines are on one NUMA domain, right? So you see that the, that the actual achieved bandwidth is flattening, right? That means that we are actually um, saturating the memory controller at around uh, six cores or so, right? So we, we don't get any, any more benefit when, when adding more cores. That's a very, very good insight because um, we, can even, we can even extend the executors in such a way that we, that we just cap, cap the number of cores to use by six, right? So we, we actually save six, six cores and that means that we can save energy, yet achieve the same performance, right? So it's a very, very nice consequence out of this. If you, if you measure your system, if you benchmark it, if you know what's going on, you can actually save energy with, with using ex, ex, uh, executors, right? And, uh, and the most important thing is that, that it scales also across um, two NUMA domains, right? So uh, where you have the, the very, very same behavior where you just stop scaling when you use uh, 12 cores in total, right? Unfortunately, we are still a little slower than the OpenMP version, so for the sake of completeness, this is done with the uh, Intel op OpenMP implementation, which is supposed to be uh, one of the best ones. So a lot of manpower goes into it, a lot of manpower goes into the um, synchronization um, primitives. It's a very, very highly optimized and very, very fast parallel programming um, environment. So it's very hard to actually get near to, to those numbers. So we're still working on on closing the rest of the gap, but I'm pretty confident that uh, we can do that. Uh, we actually identified the, the biggest problem that we, that we have there, and that's just, we just um, spawn the tasks for the, for the uh, parallel algorithm sequentially, right? So if you have a thousand tasks, we just spawn a um, thousand tasks sequ sequentially, and that's, that's not going to scale, right? And, and OpenMP doesn't, it, it doesn't do it that way. It's, it uh, creates a hierarchical um, tree of spawning the, the different work items. So um, that's probably where the, where the gap comes from, at least we hope so. However, um, you can actually mitigate this gap. So this is all about uh, hiding latency now, right? So we have another benchmark um, that's just doing a matrix transposition. And here you actually see, so this, this matrix transposition, sorry, this matrix transposition benchmark is actually able to um, to be written in such a way that all the, the different chunk sizes can be overlapped by each other, right? So we don't pay the, the uh, penalty of actually um, of, of this fork join model. So we can overlap the different, different block calculations. And that's, um, that's an example of um, where this, this whole idea really shines, right? We, we are able to, to outperform the uh, OpenMP version um, by, by some 30% or so. So that's a very, very nice achievement there. So, um, and, and that's using the very same techniques I just showed you, right? So just parallel algorithms, um, futures, and um, uh, dynamic data flow composition of those futures. So um, that's really nice. I skipped the rest of the um, things. So um, one thing that, that has been missing so far is the actual um, composition of those features, this um, management of the asynchronous control flow. Um, so, <clears throat> um, I don't know, you, you all have probably seen this so far. Shall I just skip that or is anybody really interested in that? Hmm? I'm interested. You're interested, okay. So, sorry guys. <laughs> okay, uh, so, um, what you see in this slide is, uh, so the, the async function is um, the number one way to spawn an asynchronous task, right? So you have some function, and in that case, it returns an integer. So you have the, uh, a future of int that is being returned. So that means we have a handle to a future value that is being um, computed eventually, right? So you imagine that, that it's some, some black box function or something like that. So you don't know, you don't really know when it's ready. However, you want to, to go on with your algorithm, you want to 
um, you want to say, okay, I don't really want to wait on that future to become to become ready to to use that that value that is being computed, but I kind of know what to do after that value has been computed. So I just attach a continuation to that future that is being executed whenever um, this future becomes ready, and I can continue. So and this future and, and this continuation actually returns a new future that we can use in the same manner. Um, that's um, sequential composition of futures. So um, parallel composition of futures is, um, is achievable by using when all, for example. Right? So if you have two futures and you want to wait on those two futures at the same time, you can um, combine it with when all. So you, you say when all, future one, future two, for example, and you get a new future back that represents that all of the input futures have become ready. Right, and you can actually attach a continuation again to that return future. Right, so um, you can do something when all your your parallel work has been completed. Okay. okay. Where does the when all come from? Is that a proposal to the standard? That's part of the concurrency technical specification. Yeah. So um, the concurrency technical specification also um, includes when any, um, which is just any of those input futures become ready, and um, when some, so just some of those input futures became ready. So um, you get all the power, hopefully, out of that. <coughs> Um, one, one extension that we develop within HPX is um, the, the data flow mechanism. So it's, it's in a way equivalent to, to having when all dot then. So um, the, um, the, the problem that we face is so um, if you have an, a, an asynchronous um, call, right? So what happens when, when you have futures, right? So and the normal behavior is that the futures are just being passed through. So we, we decided to extend this behavior so that this uh, function f that, that um, needs to be executed here is only executed uh, whenever all the features that, had, that, that we passed to the state of flow constructs have been ready. So um, if um, one of the argument is ready, then um, the invocation of f will be delayed. Non-future argument will be just passed through. So, um, it's it's just an abstraction over the over the when all dot then construct and but um, by by having it in, in in such a construct we are able to actually um, optimize it a little better than the um, than the when all case which has to return a distinct future for example so um, that's the the idea and um, uh, interesting interestingly enough we developed this, this construct right after Goran Nashinov um, uh, presented his first proposal um, about resumable functions, right? So um, the, the implementation uh, of this data flow is actually um, almost a one-to-one -one mapping to, to what he presented in one of his first proposals. So um, that, that really adds up very, very nicely. And the, the await keyword is, is one keyword we, we are eagerly awaiting because it makes the programming of, of those asynchronous um, systems so convenient, so easy, so composable. Um, that's really, really nice. So um, last thing I want to mention is that we are also working on uh, different fields. So uh, we have this all-scale pro project that's a European-funded project together with the University of Innsbruck. The, uh, Queen's University of Belfast, the uh, um, uh, Stockholm King's Technological, Königlich Technische Hochschule in Stockholm, sorry. Um, uh, Numeka, which is a um, computational fluid dynamics company, and IBM Research Ireland. So, uh, what we are trying to achieve here is to build a um, a environment that leverages a compiler, a source-to-source -source compiler. Uh, which is able to to 
detect constructs in such a way that, that it can um, automatically parallelize um, program based on those constructs. So the, the uh, basic primitive that we identified um, for the project um, that allows us to semi-automatically parallelize the, um, the code is recursion, right? So every time you see a recursion, instead of waiting for the, uh, for the re recursive call to return immediately, you can just say um, async um, and call this recursive function um, asynchronously, right? And that's how you get parallelism. And it turns out that you can expre express a lot of those um, numerical algorithms in a um, parallel recursive way. And um, the idea is to build um, APIs, so standard APIs and whatnot, um, with the help of those parallel recursive um, construct, constructs so that the, um, that the compiler is able to um, translate a, mm, to, to create a massively parallel program that runs in distributed uh, on those extreme st scale computing systems. Okay, so if you're interested in that, you can um, look at the website that's going to be shown um, at my last slide. So um, let me close with what's beyond exascale, right? The, the title was C++ on its way to exascale and beyond. So um, I don't think there will be anything beyond exascale with the current silicon-based technology. So um, but, but what I believe what's beyond is um, parallelism is here to stay, right? So it won't go away. And um, massive parallel hardware is already it's already part of our daily lives. So um, look at your phones. You have a GPU in there. You have uh, a dual or quad core in there. And um, those parallelism things will, will get increased. So and and you 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 can expect that all this um, supercomputing technology will be um, will be tickled in into the regular consumer devices, right? So um, for the GPUs, it was actually the other way around. So you had the um, NVIDIA GPUs, right? And they, uh, it turns out that some, um, some clever scientist figured out how to program this, this GPU device for his numerical simulations. So NVIDIA decided to step in there and um, use their technology to help the scientists here. So, um, but yeah, I think we, we, we experience um, massive parallel systems today already. So you have the Internet of Things, which which is a massive amount of different devices that exist in parallel, that want to communicate with each other in parallel, that uh, want to talk with each other. It's, of course, a very, very different problem than the numerical simulations. However, I believe that the, um, that the techniques we developed actually help in, in this domain as well. Then we have the embedded market, right, where, where you have um, usually energy aware systems. You have to keep a power budget, right? But you still have to do a lot of computations if you, um, if you look at, for example, um, face recognition systems or, um, or sensors that compute some, um, I don't know whether, whether an elderly people has been fallen or just sat down, right? So that's um, some examples where you, where you really need to have compute power. Um, and the, the, current, the current technological developments show that um, you can get um, higher energy efficiency um, when you add more parallelism. And you have some, some examples there. And of course, automotive, so autonomous driving and um, all those things require massive computational power, but you can't put a supercomputer in the trunk of a car. So um, thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions?